Okay. Oh, everybody can hear me now. Even better. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Selung. I'm a senior scientist at the University of Stuttgart. And today I would like to share with all of you a bit of some of the research that we've been doing regarding um, emerging trust infrastructures, um, specifically some of our projects on blockchain and on the Lycos project, um, which is a European Union funded project um, that's also dealing with building a globally trusted infrastructure. Maybe. Okay. So uh, as you can see in my first slide, um, I'm coming from an academic background, so uh, none of my slides are as beautiful as, or as inspiring as uh, some of the other slides that we've seen at this conference. However, um, it should all be there and hopefully it won't be an eyesore. Um, but basically what I would like to talk about is um, the emerging trust infrastructures just in general, the, the what and the why, um, and then blockchain as a trust infrastructure, and then um, lightest, and then overall some open research questions and thoughts that we have um, been dealing with. So, okay, a trust infrastructure, what does that even mean? Um, just to kind of get a basic idea who has heard of a trust infrastructure or familiar with working with them? Anybody, raise your hand. I know you do, you're one of our advisory board members in Lightest, so. <laughs> okay, awesome. So um, basically, my general definition of what a trust infrastructure is, is that it's basically a system or an infrastructure that assists in um, making trust decisions between users and electronic transactions. Um, that's simply put, so this is just my opinion. Um, however, in the European Union sense, or the European Commission, they see it as more of a, uh, a means to how we can use, um, well, they have these trust services and also EIDAS and, and trust lists that they're trying to utilize. Um, so they see it as a means to better use those um, opportunities. So this is, in their means, qualified signatures, qualified uh, certificates, um, timestamps, and whatnot. Um, and then from a US perspective, I guess a more relatable term would be um, regarding um, trust frameworks or trust seats. Um, however, overall, uh, we could say that um, this is one way that we can use and optimize digital processes and transactions um, to further integrate and optimize our digital world, to put it in a nice and fluffy sense. <laughs> um, so why all the attention? So usually when we get asked to do a different research projects or we um, pursue uh, getting our own research projects ourselves by um, applying for different European Union proposals for research grants, um, we, we have to consider what are the demands or, or, why, or why are we getting all these people that want to come up to us and ask, okay, so I heard about this blockchain, what is it? Uh, my boss told me we have to do something with it, so um, what do you think? And basically, we see that a lot of the problems that they're trying to um, fix with um, some of these trust infrastructures are very basic and uh, actually overlapping quite a bit. So issues with uh, data organization, a lack of interoperability um, of data sources, or increased demand of control of processing data. I'm sure all of you have received um, many emails regarding GDPR last month. Um, where companies are now required to um, have higher um, yeah, control over different data protection and how it's being processed. And then the overall Trump part of um, the pressure of incre in improving digitalization. So while those are all the issues, a much lighter sense or a general themes of, of all of these listed there are yeah, to incre increase security or to improve interoperability um, and also data, pro data processing control and overall optimization in um, these digitalization processes. Okay, so what we are now trying to do within our research, um, me and a few uh, people on our team, uh, is to kind of try to compare and contrast these two similar uh, goal-oriented projects and how um, one can maybe be the alternative to one another and try to see and get an overall comprehensive perspective of um, the advantages of both and to get a, a larger perspective because one of the things that we do is that we want to um, be open to 
um, seeing the bigger picture. So we don't have a self motive, motive of like whether or not blockchain per se is, is successful, but we want to know for the, sa for the sake of knowledge in <laughs> my research academic uh, heart of mine, um, but also to kind of assist, um, uh, to kind of be a matchmaker between what the industry needs, but also what um, research and um, universities are trying to pursue. So, back to my agenda, um, <laughs> uh, to the blockchain uh, products that we are doing. Um, we have a few that I would like to showcase. Um, one of them, is the one on the far right, it's called Kette. Uh, Kette is, our fun fact, um, Kette <laughs> is chain in German, uh, and is in fact a German startup. Um, they're quite small, however, they're being, um, uh, they're, they're utilizing their prototype with a very large global uh, insurance company, which unfortunately I can't name. <laughs> um, and we're assisting them in a feasibility uh, study because they are actually, they have a blockchain solution to um, assist in GDPR compliance. So as many companies, especially insurance companies where they have all of this sensitive data, they're looking for any solution to kind of help in this. And they have a very basic solution using blockchain um, that they're showcasing in this um, international uh, insurance company. And we're doing a feasibility study to kind of help support or, or hopefully so support them in this mission. Um, the other two in the middle are the European Blockchain Center and uh, the IT University of Copenhagen. Um, we are currently working together with them on, um, on a project that we are doing, in fact, with a U.S. startup uh, that has just been very well funded uh, <laughs> and is looking to do and expand over Europe. And uh, in order to do that, they, they would like to have a study on um, a specific European country um, on the more so the macroeconomic effects of um, blockchain. So for them in particularly, we're looking at um, specific industries where um, different blockchain solutions, whether it's via startups or via different processes within individual companies that are trying to uh, implement blockchain um, and how these are maybe common factors in certain industries but not in others. Um, particularly, we found quite a few uh, within the supply chain industry and logistics. Um, so we're kind of like looking, okay, so how are these affecting these industries? And then in turn, how will this maybe affect that economy in itself? Um, and then with this study, we're not only looking at the macroeconomic factors, but also the uh, microeconomic factors where we are like looking at these use cases in a greater detail and looking to see how um, at those specific problems that they're trying to solve with these like these prototypes or these, Im these smaller implementations within the company or like these startups and what problems they're trying to solve if it makes sense that they're being solved like that, if there's maybe an alternative um, and just in general um, try to kind of nitpick and try to evaluate how or how or why this is happening and if it makes sense <laughs> from, from a, a very general neutral perspective. Um, so yeah, so we are working together with them on, on this project. Uh, and then the last project that I would like to showcase um, is actually a project that we are working with the UNHCR, so the United Nations um, Agency of Refugees. Um, we are currently uh, in, we actually we, we just committed to um, doing a project with them for over the next six months, um, where they're looking to um, kind of optimize some of their um, identity issues with um, refugees uh, and they're looking at maybe having a blockchain solution. Um, however, it's, it's uncertain whether or not that would make sense. So uh, over the next six months, we plan to have a pilot program um, where we would help um, evaluate, mentor, and collect these pilots. Um, so pilots are basically um, maybe startups or people who have prototypes or different solutions who would apply for our um, our proposal or our call of um, potential pilots and then after they would apply then we would help the UNHCR decide which one should be um, should progress to the next stage and then we would help them go through this program and then at the end of the day hopefully the UNHCR would then decide which one to implement and um, so if anybody's in the audience who would maybe uh, be interested in this feel free to contact me afterwards this call of proposals will happen um, probably by the end of August or the beginning of September. Um, so yes, so that's some of our blockchain research. 
Um, as you can see, our, if um, I was clear enough, um, maybe you could tell that all of these four themes were in fact in, involved in all of these projects that I mentioned and what we are doing. Um, so this is kind of how it ties in together. However, um, one could say that these use cases that I was talking about could also be uh, involved in the next thing I'll be talking about, um, which is not Ketchin, um, <laughs> in Lifus. However, um, I forgot I wanted to talk a little bit more about Ketchin. Um, Ketchin was the uh, German startup that is um, involved with the insurance company. And it, this slide basically just explains a little bit more of how they're leveraging certain parts of blockchain, um, such as transparency, traceability, and compatibility. Um, to meet some of the demands of GDPR, uh, such as erasure and uh, restriction, of, uh, restriction of pro processing. But um, yeah, so overall, um, that's basically what we are working on at the moment. Um, we're to the first stages of some of our expectations and first thoughts, um, and now we are open to insights and um, discussion. So if anybody um, would. If you feel that you're an expert in blockchain or if you are an industry expert that has interest in blockchain, um, we will be doing some um, expert interviews uh, shortly in the next uh, month or two. Um, so please contact me if you are interested in more information on the United Nations Agency for Refugees project and potentially being a pilot, um, feel free to contact me after. Okay, so um, next up, Lightus. So um, this is kind of like, mm, they're, they're doing similar things, but actually in a very different way. So Lightus, it's a European Union project um, that was funded in September 2016. Um, it was funded with around 8.4 million euros from the European Union, so they seem to like our idea. Um, <laughs> and we are, <laughs> we are a consortium filled with 14 different partners um, from nine different countries. And we don't just vary in uh, cultures, but we also vary in um, expertise. So we are not just um, academics that are leading this initiative, um, but we are um, also have many different industry uh, leaders that are also involved, such as GND, UV Secure, um, and IBM was also involved. Um, so, and this is being led or coordinated by Fraunhofer Institute, which is um, Euro Europe's largest uh, applied research uh, institute. So basically, what is Lightus? Well, basically it's a tool that is um, a global trust infrastructure that is used to determine and verify digital trust um, assessments or assurances to facilitate decision making and assisting risk. Um, I think the best way to kind of get a feel about what the tool does would be to kind of jump into our use cases and particularly some of the use cases that we're even implementing. So we started off with implementing um, actually a, a pilot that we didn't expect to. We, um, we worked together with uh, a German project called Industrial Data Space, which is focused on Industry 4.0 and um, one of their use cases for pr predictive maintenance. And we uh, implemented the lightest infrastructure in this use case where um, basically it controls the, the trust management between uh, different sensors and, and machines. So, so it can be as small as just the communication and trust between different parts of the machine. Um, and then we have two pilots uh, within our project. Um, one is led by Correos, the Spanish Postal Service, where they are focusing on um, a few different use cases regarding e-delivery or citizen services that they are providing. So it's not just basically a, a digital notary, but trying to help move forward from these bureaucratic uh, paper-based processes into a more digitalized format. Uh, and then our other use case is, um, is uh, our pilot per se is Pepo, um, and this was being led by IBM. Uh, and this is basically, Pepal is a pan-European um, procurement um, system that's already been implemented. Uh, and um, basically we are looking to integrating Lightus into this already existing system to kind of um, help optimize how these decisions of electronic tra and transactions are made. Um, and then our last uh, pilot that I would like to kind of like showcase is actually again with the UNHCR. So with the United Nations a Agency for Refugees. So with them, um, we are addressing a similar problem to what I talked about before, um, however, in a, a different way. So this will be perfect for us to be able to compare later on. 
Um, but basically, um, we are looking at the academic use case um, for the UNHCR, where they have all these different databases, and each database is a little bit different per country, um, of different IDs or refugees' IDs or certificates, like diplomas and whatnot, that they, that they get and that they look at, and they also go through their own process of trying to decide whether or not it's a true document or not, because sometimes you don't know if it's falsified or not. Um, and they want to help these refugees get into university programs and to study and to further continue their lives. Um, and that's one of the main issues that we're trying to solve um, with them. So how are we going, to, our first step is actually to um, build a trust scheme. So we are planning, are in talks of planning, um, um, establishing a trust scheme for the UNHCR. So then, because right now everything is paper-based. So if they would have a trust scheme, then this process would be, um, simplified and uh, a lot easier to be digitalized and um, uh, optimized in any electronic transaction. And this would also help the university say, okay, so um, I have this refugee who just applied and they have this document. I don't really know where that school is, but actually the UNHCR looked at this and well, I trust them, so maybe I would accept this. Of course, the trust and the decision of trust is always dependent on the entities themselves. However, this could help this process along. So, those are some of our use cases that we are working on um, and actually implementing in the next year and a half. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip over the legal stuff, um, but I do think that um, looking at our reference architecture um, would be good to see, uh, especially as I'm trying to compare this a little bit to blockchain. Um, basically, like this is not a decentralized network. Um, however, for most of the things that we like to do, we don't per se always need that. Um, but as you can see in the bottom four, um, the bottom left four corners, I don't know <laughs> if I said that pro properly, this is um, basically the user, so by this um, little woman icon. So it's, um, that's basically the app or the, the, what you would have on your phone, which has two functions. So one function would be um, to create your trust policy and this would be okay, so I trust this or I don't trust this, or if you have this document, um, yeah, how would you accept this or not? And then the other uh, function would be to actually automize this process where you would go through and you would check all of these different types of electronic documents um, automatically. Um, and then on the upper half, you see the world. The world is representing the already globally trusted infrastructure that we are actually building off of, which is the DNS, the domain name system. This is basically the network that um, the internet is built off of, so, <laughs> um, and to be and to put in layman's uh, terms, um, I'm also more from a economic discipline and not so technical, so. Um, but basically, we're not holding any of the information on the DNS, and we're also not holding any of the information within the tool, so in case anybody is a little bit worried. Um, however, we are using the DNS and their already established global network as kind of a GPS between the different sources of data. Um, and then those three boxes in the middle, these are the three different functions of the Lightest tool. So basically, um, from left to right, uh, you would have the trust scheme publication authority, which would be um, the kind of like the verifier, so what it would, um, which electronic transactions would verify is yes or no, um, and then the translation card, which would be okay, so if this, this is A, does this translate into B, and then um, delegation. So those are the three functions of the tool itself. Okay. Um, so basically, that's some more uh, general information about the Lightest project. And actually, that's, that's all. So um, thank you all um, for listening. I hope uh, you are intrigued um, a little bit. And um, thank you. <laughs> if our panelists could join us.